So it's uh, 6.59, we're gonna start in just a second here. Chip, would you go ahead and change the screen on the iPad to just flip the slide? Just so it's here instead of there. Is this too loud or is this okay? Yeah, it's probably
apologize for this. Okay. Oh, they can hear now. I think they can hear now. Okay. Yeah. So turn that, turn that down and see. See if that's better. Gosh, I'm, I apologize, guys. Can you guys hear me now? She says no. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep it like that. I'm hoping. Uh... Well, now I'm going to keep the cable. I'm going to keep the cable on here. All right, we're going to we're going to have to keep going. I apologize for those online. Uh, Go ahead, you're going to have to mute that one, Chip, and we'll, we'll hopefully be able to record that later. Oh, <laughs> our, our worship pastor that normally helps me with this is in the hospital in Denver right now, so. <laughs> uh, but we're going to go ahead and read Deuteronomy 28, verses 1, 2, and 8. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. On your barns and on everything you put on your hand to the Lord your God will bless you. And go on and it says, However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all of his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. The fruit of your womb will be cursed, and the crops of your land, and the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever and inflammation, with scorching heat and drought, with blight and mildew, which will plague you until you perish. You will sow much seed in the field, but you will harvest little because the locusts will devour it. All these curses will come on you. They will pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not obey the Lord your God and observe the commands and decrees he gave you. It's really important for us to know that, isn't it? This is, well, you'll see. You'll see why this is important. One more passage I want us to look at. Amos 4, 9. Locust devoured your fig and olive trees, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Hmm. So first God says, if you turn from me, 
I'm going to send curses and and you're going I'm going to do this to get your attention and make you realize that you've fallen away and put it on your heart to return to me. And in Amos, he even said, I sent locusts to get your attention. You were supposed to get it, recognize that this was judgment because of your sins and return to me, and you still haven't done it. So pretty clear you know, what, what God has told the Jews, isn't it? On this, they know this. They know this. We don't know this. They know this. They know that they are to wake up and return. So today, here's a question we should ask. If we see famine coming upon our land, if we see an increase in floods, plagues, earthquakes coming upon our nation, what's the first thing that we should do? What should we do? repent and turn to God and and if not for ourselves for our nation we need to repent and turn to God so if we follow Daniel's example remember in our study of Daniel as we were going through Daniel uh, Daniel gosh he was faithful even though he was in Babylon he was absolutely faithful and he just kept continuing to pray to God and in Daniel 9 he was brokenhearted, realizing the sins of his people all the years. And he realized that they were in Babylon because of their sin. That's why they had been taken exile, taken exile into Babylon. And so Daniel prayed for his nation for God to forgive their sins. But he didn't say they. Watch what he said. Daniel 9, 4 through 15. Oh Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. This is Daniel, who is very faithful. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on your authority. Lord, you are in the right, but as you see, our faces are covered with shame. This is true of all of us, including, and I'm going to change it here, everyone in the United States. Our, oh Lord, we and our government officials and our ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. But the Lord, our God, is merciful and forgiving. Even though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the Lord, our God, for we have not followed the instructions he gave gave us through his word, our nation has disobeyed your instruction and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. I paraphrase that. Did you see that? That was not word for word. That was, I inserted things in there to make us get the point. To me, I'm realizing as I'm reading through Joel that I need to pray like Daniel. I need to go through and pray like Daniel. This is how he prayed for Israel. He prayed for forgiveness and he said, we, not they. I need to do the same thing. Now, with all that understanding, now let's dive into Joel. So let's start with Joel chapter one. We're gonna the first three verses and it says, the word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, O elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Tell your sons about it and let your sons tell their sons and their sons the next generation. So what's the first thing we're told in verse one? What's the first, first thing we see here? First phrase. That God established the record of Exactly. He says, the word of the Lord came to me. In other words, he's, just, he's not speculating. God's given him the word to give to these people and he is just obediently telling them what God is saying. It's the word of the Lord. Joel knew that he didn't have the right answers. He knew he had to rely strictly on what God was saying. That reminds me, I wanna make sure that whatever I'm sharing is God's word. I've gotta be very careful in sharing, I think this could be, I, I wanna make sure there's not a whole lot of I and there's a whole lot of God 
than what comes out of my mouth, right? If I talk too loud and I'm not, or talk too long and I'm not reading God's word, that's a problem. Uh, notice in these first three verses, there's no date given, just like we said. It doesn't say the prophet Joel in the reign of King ABC. Not in there. That's okay. We don't care. Or you say 2,800 years and we move on. Verse two, I feel like the question Joel asked could easily be asked today. Is what we're seeing happen today like anything our parents or grandparents ever saw in their lifetime? I, I, my dad died five years ago in 2017, right Sue? Sue was one of my dad's nurses at the assisted living. Um, he'd be rolling over in his grave to see what has happened just in the time since he died. I think Joel's point here in asking this question in verse two is, he is seeing things, he's seeing what's happening, and he's realizing it's not normal. And it's not even just unusual. He's going, hey, this is God's judgment upon us here. You guys realize this? This is not everyday uh, mother nature. This is not climate change. It's God's judgment. It's unlike anything they have lived through before. Chip talked to, my husband Chip, he talked to his dad um, recently, the last week, I think. And uh, his dad is 84 years old and he was kind of talking to his dad about, hey, you know, you might want to think about storing up some food because we've got the supply chain and the, um, we've got diesel shortages, food shortages, fertilizer shortages. You might want to think about storing up some food. And his dad's response is, I've never, ever had trouble finding food. And his dad's absolutely right. He's 84 years old. He's always been gainfully employed and is a gainfully employed person in his 80s. He's never, in the United States, had trouble finding food. And that's true of anyone in the last 80 years here, unless they were going through a period of unemployment or something. If they were employed, Anywhere here in the United States, last 80 years, didn't have any problems finding food. That fact can lull all of us in this nation to sleep. It can make us have this false sense of security of, oh, nothing's gonna happen. I think that's what the people here that Joel were talking to, that Joel was talking to, I think they had that false sense of security that we have today. Well, I should say, I wonder. I wonder if they did. So what is it that's happening here? Well, Joel's about to describe the effects of a severe locust plague which swept over their land, destroying all of the crops. Everything. Everything that man and beast had, let me turn that down just a little bit. Uh, they were about to experience this famine as a result of losing everything and they were not fully realizing it. Notice what Joel says in verse three and let's realize the importance of it. We must tell our children and their children and their children's children after them. This is big. Tell your sons and their sons and their, their sons' sons. Everybody needs to know what we're going through. This is big. Got to tell your children about the Bible, about Bible prophecy that's being fulfilled in our lifetime. By the way, you got to tell Bible, about Bible prophecy that was fulfilled in the past. Guess what else? You got to tell them about Bible prophecy that will be fulfilled in the future. You got to tell them about God's word and how it applies to everything that we're seeing around us. We must teach them scripture and how to apply it, how to recognize it, how to look at what's going on, how to look at current events through the lens of the Bible and understand what it means. Joel is telling them, hey, we, we've got we've to tell people now. Do you do that? Do we do that? Do, are, are we speaking to our kids about that? Deb Beitler here, her son, John Paul, some of you know John Paul. If you've ever seen him, you know him because he doesn't know a stranger. John Paul posted a 
a video of himself and his four-year-old son Maverick this week. He's just he's decided to post a video, and uh, and he it, he's he's got Maverick on his shoulders and he's taking him into preschool, and so from the from the parking lot into school he's got him on his shoulders and he's got his phone. He's just recording recording it and he's having a conversation with him. And the conversation went something like this: Maverick, who do you love more than anyone? Jesus. Maverick, who died for our sins? Jesus. Maverick, who do we live for? Jesus. This was their conversation from the parking lot into school. Maverick, Maverick, who loves you more than anyone? Who died for you, Maverick? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Okay, Maverick, are you going to go learn today? Yes. That's what we need to do. That's what we all need to do. We all need to be pouring Jesus into our kids and our grandkids. And that's what Joel is telling them. You're going to tell your sons and your sons' sons about this. You've got to make sure that they understand that the old, dusty Bible, that's actually God's word. And it's actually come true. And we need to understand it. We need to be able to relate to what it is and, and understand it. So the question is, is, as we study Joel, will the veil be removed from our eyes? As we study Joel, will the veil be removed from our eyes where we actually see how it relates to what we're going through and what, what's coming, what we're about to go through? Will we recognize it? Will we draw close to God and, and prepare for what's still to come, the birth pains? which will continue to increase in frequency and intensity before Jesus comes to take us out of here? That's a question on my mind. Now, that's what I got out of these first three verses. And I've talked a whole lot, but you guys haven't talked at all. What else do you get out of these first three verses? What questions do you have? What thoughts do you have? And you're not allowed to not say anything because I'm standing on it from around you. What do you think? Is there anything else I missed in those first three verses? Fred, you always have something. Why is he addressing it to the elders? Ah, why is he addressing it to the elders? Good question. I think I know, but why don't you tell us? I don't know. I haven't told you. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Fred, okay, so I'll pick on Fred here. Oh, he, he hates that. He's not going to take it. Oh, good, good. He took it. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Fred is one of the three, one of our three elders in this church, and so if there's something going on um, that that I want to know about related to this church or something else, we like Sue. Sue's going to go and talk to Fred and say, Fred, because the elders are the ones that teach us, right? And so Fred's one of our elders. So Joel is going and saying, "Hear this, O elders, and listen." Now this is unusual because Joel is a prophet. And he's telling the elders, hear this, listen, and go, and that they need to be leaving, right? That's what I would take. What do you take, Fred? Well, come to understanding. He, he tried to set that down, didn't he? The temple is standing. Yes. And the people go to the priest. Mm -hmm. Why isn't it addressing the priest for the priest to tell the people? He addressed the priest later. But it's specifically talking about to the elders. Specifically to the elders, yeah. What do you think? I think it goes back to why. Well, elders, it goes back to Exodus 28, when just before... Moses was up on Mount Sinai, came back down. The people received the law. They said, yes, we will follow this and do it and obey it. And then Moses went back up to receive it on the tablets, and that's when they were sent. And there's the elders that were supposed to wait. And so I think it's going back what you're tying in with Deuteronomy, that it's Well, part of it, I think the priests are not doing their job. Yeah, or the elders. Or the elders. Yeah, yeah. So now he's now he's going back. Does someone else have another? You have a thought, Robin? The translation is being amplified. Okay. 
So from the Amplified translation, it says here this, you aged men. So it's the aged men? And give ear all you inhabitants of the land. Okay, so, so not only is he addressing the aged men, he's addressing all inhabitants. Right, right. So, so. instead of elders, he, oh, elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land, it says all aged men. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And the inhabitants of the land. Okay? Interesting. Something to pay attention to as we go on. Any other thoughts on these before we go on to the next passage? It ties it to Revelation. How so, Fred? It ties it to Revelation. When you look at the elders, the first time that word is used, what does it mean? It ties to Revelation because it's using the word elders. The word elders in Exodus 28, that's the first time that word is used. Mm -hmm. It says that the elders saw God and he was on a ground that was clear like the sky, but as but sapphire. And it was 80 elders. So you're thinking of Revelation 4. Correct. Mm -hmm. And I think that ties to prophecy of Joel to Revelation. Okay. Mm, interesting. Very good. All right. Well, if no one has anything else, let's go on and see what, uh, as he starts describing what's going on here in verses 4 through 7. Let's read Joel 1, 4 through 7. Now it's describing the, the uh, locust. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. And what the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. Awake, drunkards, and weep and wail, all you wine drinkers, on account of the sweet wine that is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of the lion, and it has the fangs of the lioness. It has made my vine a waste and my fig tree splinters. It has stripped them bare and cast them away. Their branches have become white. So in the previous passage, um, something earth shattering had happened and Joel was saying, wake up, wake up. Here, we're told what he's talking about. What is it that's happening? What's happening all across the land of Judah? A locust invasion, a, 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 a locust swarm has destroyed all of their crops. Their food source was completely destroyed. Do you know it only takes a matter of hours for swarming locusts to completely wipe out a crop? It's like 30,000 people eating. Boom, it's gone. It's just gone. So in effect, overnight, and again, I'm just paraphrasing, overnight they woke up and they discovered their grocery store shelves had been completely emptied and there's absolutely no way to restock them. Gone. Everything. Completely gone. That's the situation. And Joel is saying, wake up. Look what has happened. Verse 5, he, he calls the drunkards to awaken. Why is he calling the drunkards? What is, and what does he mean by awake? Why is he calling out to the drunkards? So the, the drunkards, um, uh, the, as Sue said, they're kind of in a stupor. They don't know what's going on. They have no idea that the wine is gone. It's gone. I think there's even more to that, though, than the physical wake up. Don't you? So he's telling them to wake up spiritually. Guys, wake up. Understand why this is happening to us, right? It's not that they're all drunk. They're in a delusion. There's a veil over their eyes. They're not realizing 
what's going on and what's happening. Hmm. Can we relate that to today? Yeah, yeah, he's using a drunkard as an example. La La Land. Yeah, just hang on to that, Sue. Um, they wouldn't have believed that they deserved God's judgment. I mean, life is good. They're just enjoying life, kicking back. Everything's good. And he's referring to them as drunkards that need to wake up. They, they wouldn't have felt like, Sue said that it was, they didn't understand their sin. They wouldn't have felt like Anything that was going on was a result of anything that they did wrong, right? And it could also be referring to the Laodicean church. Yeah. If you're looking into the future. Yeah. Present. Yeah, if you're looking into the future, it could certainly re refer to the Laodicean church that's just lukewarm, not hot nor cold, which Jesus said he would spit out of his, spit out of his mouth. So Joel is telling them to wake up from their complacency to admit their sins and turn back to God while there's still time. Now, could God be saying the same thing to us today? Could he be saying the thing, could Joel's message not just be written to these people 2,800 years ago, could it also be written to us today? Wow, I think it's unbelievable. I think the timing is just unbelievable. Our world today is the drunkard who's being lulled to sleep. And, the, and and our government's even saying, yeah, it's gonna get real. Food shortages are coming. Yeah, we're having problems with diesel. Yeah, prices are going up. Yeah, it's all because of Ukraine. And we're going, oh, okay, okay. Are we doing anything? Are we doing anything about it? I think God intended Joel's message for the drunkards of today. And I think we need to take the example of Daniel in our prayer. Verse 6, Joel does a sudden change of subject. And this can be a little confusing because first he's talking about these locusts. They're absolutely wiping out everything. And then all of a sudden in verse 6 he says, a nation who has invaded his land. Does that mean there was locusts and the locusts wiped out everything? And then after the locusts wiped out everything, then God sent a nation to invade the land? Is that what's going on? Robin's going, no. What's going on, Robin? Um, it just says here that he goes in chapter 9, 7, and 8. Okay. And then it also Wait, says take that, take that mic there. It says it's an illustrative of a human foe, the, the locust song. Of a human foe, okay. Yeah. And I okay. had heard another teaching of this um, back in verse 4, that that could be the four empires. Mm. So. Okay. I... Yeah, and, and certainly there can be different opinions of it. I see it as actually locusts, right? I actually see this as locusts. And when they, when he describes the enemy, uh, this enemy nation, I think it's locusts. And the reason that I think it's locusts is as we go on here and we look at uh, verse 7, when we look at the description, if you go and you study a locust plague, and you see how they describe the locust plague, it's exactly what this is saying. So it's saying an enemy nation, but it's saying this invading army has made my vine a waste, my fig tree splinter, it has stripped them bare, their branches have become white. When locusts attack a fig tree, they're eating the branches down to where the bark, the white bark is exposed. So when you see this description, and if you go and compare it to the description of locusts, even though it's saying an enemy nation, it's still the description of what happens when locusts. Now, could it have uh, a foreshadowing? Yes. I think a whole bunch of Joel is a foreshadowing, but I also think this is an actual um, locust invasion, a locust swarm that's happened to them. Now, can we prove that with history? No, nope, because we don't know when in the world he's talking about. So we can't really relate it to history. Sue? Just as you went off, but I wondered, I wondered if it had anything to do with the invasion of Gog Magog, um, just the invading army coming down 
destroying Israel, the only way they can come out of this is for God to rescue them. That would match what Robin's saying. In a way, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, except that what she was talking about was the fifth trumpet, which I don't know if that coincided with, with God Magog appearing. Well, uh, we don't know I when don't know God Magog actually, yeah. actually happens. Yeah. Within that, I mean, you know, there's it, a lot it could, of... It could span the whole seven years of the tribulation. We don't know, but, but that could. may be beyond the scope of what I'm, what we're talking about. But it's just something that came to mind for me. True, true. What about, how is this key to our time today? What's a takeaway for us from verses four through seven for our time today? <laughs> Jesus told us in Matthew 24 7 that one of the birth pains that would happen before the tribulation which I think means before he returns is famine famine is a birth pain famine is the only birth pain we have not seen to date and we're being told it's coming we're not going to see the tribulation if if you have repented and trusted in Jesus and you're following him you're not going to see the tribulation but we're already seeing the birth pains. So I don't have any reason to believe that a famine, one of the birth pains, wouldn't be something we would see also. But we're not going to see the third seal of judgment famine. We're going to see birth pain famine. Why? Why would God allow us to see birth pains? Why would he allow us to see famine as a birth pain? So that we make sure we are repenting and turning to him and praying for others and getting our Laodicean rearers out of the chairs and going and telling, telling people that, you know what, don't wait. We don't know how much time we have. And you're living without Jesus now. So you're, you're doing it all on your own. You're missing out on the joy that you could have with him now and the comfort and the strength that you could have with him now. Don't wait, don't wait, don't wait. Truly, you have to be like, oh, I, I believe. No, I believe in Jesus. No, no, so do the demons. The demons believe in Jesus too, but they don't follow. And, and what we're talking about is actually following, actually living for him. That's what we need to be doing. And, and guys, we've talked about the, the food shortages and the famine for the last month. The potential of that but if we're warning people just about food shortages and famine we're missing it we have to tell them of the why why scripture says this would come and what we should be doing about it not just stocking up yeah stock up stock up but not just stocking up we need to be making sure we're taking the most priority to be waking up and not being a drunkard right so, um, anything else from, actually, we're, we're going to be out of time here, too. Uh, is there anything else we want to talk about through 4 through 7? You know, it talks about the vine. Yes. Jesus is about that time, where the vine will be Okay. Yep. We're going to do uh, eight verse. Uh, Tina had said that um, when she sees a, the vine, it makes her think of John 14, 6. I am the vine, you are the branches. And that we are to remain in him. And that's, that's, a good, that's a good point. We do. We need to remain in him. There's a difference between saying I'm a believer and truly remaining plugged into Jesus so that we are living for him every day. Yeah. Um, we're not going to go on to, to 8 on, which is nice about not having a schedule. We discuss as we go. We don't rush through it. We'll go through, we'll start in verse 8 next week. And the reason we always want to stop a few minutes early is we want to talk about application. We, we don't want to just go, oh, okay, well, right now I have a much better understanding of verses 1 through 7 of Joel chapter 1. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to live it out? What are you going to remember about what the purpose is of Joel in these first seven verses? What are you going to share with others? What's your application? 
from just these first seven verses. Raise your hand, and then Chip's going to give you a microphone. I actually had an opportunity to share today. I was with my sister. Awesome. Uh, we were driving from Lincoln to visit a relative, and I, we were talking about what's happening in the world, and, and she's stocking up and prepping and all that good stuff, and she is a believer. And I just explained how we were struggling with your aunt and how it just made me think of, of what's going on now in relation to what Joel is saying. And so just just relate to her that God's letting us know what's why things are happening. Yeah, not just that we famine is coming. Right. We aren't in the dark about it. There's a reason for it. It's not just because the Federal Reserve isn't doing their job or whatever. I don't understand economics or any of that other stuff, but there's a spiritual yes. component to all of this. That's the main thing. Our government can explain this, this, and this. This is why the supply chain, this is why the fertilizer. Chip can explain the fertilizer. He works for the railroad. It, we can explain all these things, but above all these things is God, and none of this stuff happens that doesn't perfectly align with God's timeline. And if we're seeing famine and earthquake, or in, I'm sorry, earthquakes increasing in, in um, frequency and intensity. We're seeing plagues. We're seeing pestilence increasing in frequency and, in frequency and intensity. When we look at scripture and we are a nation that was established under God, saying that we would obey him and we, our nation is turned away, well, then we know what we need to do. We have control of ourselves. We need to be repentant. We need to be praying for our nation. We need to repent for our nation. And then we need to share that with as many people as we can. But that's my application. But Sue's giving her application to someone else. What's your application? John. <laughs> okay, uh, on Joel 3, when it says share with your sons and their sons and their sons, that's very difficult. But imagine how much more difficult it is if we skip a generation. So it's very important that, as a believer and one who repented to make sure I'm not the one that lets that happen. So it puts more emphasis on what you have to do. And I also like the we and Daniel. We talked about that when we were going through Daniel. That we, whether we were believers, repentance, we are still part of we and are going through this stuff right now with everyone else. Okay, so John has a son and a daughter. Now, keep, hang on to that. Uh, married, he's got grandkids. John, do you have control of whether or not you share with them? Uh, yes, I have control. Okay. Of that. He has control of whether or not he shares with them. Do you have control of whether or not they respond and, and turn to Christ? No. 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 You do not have control. Uh, what if you share it perfectly? I mean, what if you do a Billy Graham just perfect? Is that going to make a difference? It's not going to make any difference no. at all. No. What else could you do in addition to sharing that might make a difference? Pray for them. Pray. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that hangs the heart and we're just the mouthpiece that God uses so we pray for the opportunities we share as God gives us those opportunities we continue to pray but it's up to God it's up to God great application someone else Robin's got one over here Chip Chip's getting his exercise this is great when when I dive into the Old Testament it just always speaks of the importance of knowing the whole counsel of God. Yeah. And who he is. Here he is, he loves us so much that he's warning us. Yeah. I mean, and he's a promise keeper. He loves us. He warns us. He does not want us to go this way. Yeah, the purpose. He's giving us a chance to repent. Right. I mean, that just speaks of just this unspeakable, undescribable love that he has for us. So every time I dive into something like this, this is always 
something that comes up to the surface. I'm so glad you said that because when we look at the Old Testament and we look at, oh gosh, all this sad gloom and doom, famine, but then when we realize it's correction, it's God saying, hey, turn back to me. You're off track. You're going down a danger zone. Come back, come back, come back. That's the purpose of the famine. And even in the tribulation period, even in the seven-year tribulation period, as he keeps turning up the heat on judgment after judgment after judgment, his heart is that people would repent and turn back. So we have to remember that. And in Joel's time, he didn't get to see the salvation that we get to see on this side of the cross, that God has come and he's made the way that we can't, we know how we can repent and what we need to trust in and who we need to share. Joel, all Joel had was, God's telling me to share this. I'm going to obediently share this. But he didn't have, he was looking in the direction to where he didn't know how he was going to complete it. So we have that. We have the whole story. Someone else, what's your application? What are you going to take away from verses 1 through 7? thought of another thing that the prophets were often ignored. Oh yeah. Nobody paid attention to them, nobody believed them, nobody thought too much of them. And that may be like us today when we're sharing. People may not think too much of what we're saying. She's nuts, she's wacko, whatever. But when when push comes to shove, when it really starts to happen, they're going to know, hmm, maybe she was telling me the truth. Maybe there is something to that God she's been telling me about. So anyway, it just... Such a great point. Eventually, what, they're going to find out. What prophet was not ridiculed and ignored? Name one. None. None. They were all looked at as crazy wackos, right? Like, just, they're out of their minds. They're just sharing all this stuff. But it came true. What they're sharing came true. So here we are, God's telling us to share, he's given us his Holy Spirit, and we're afraid what people think. We're supposed to just be obedient. We're supposed to just trust him and share, and then hope that they're going to start putting things together as things start coming. Can you imagine if we shared with everyone, listen, famine is coming because we're getting close to the end of time and God says in Matthew 24, 7, that before we get to the tribulation, there's going to be famine and pestilence and an increase of earthquakes. And by the way, earthquakes are increasing off the charts and we're seeing weather patterns increase off the charts and we're seeing pestilence increase and famine's coming. If we tell people that and then famine comes, Maybe they will get it, but we need to be praying for it. We need to be praying, praying, praying. How much are you praying? How much are you praying for your family members who don't know Jesus? Hey, we need to pray. Now, I'm not pointing fingers, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm not pointing fingers at all. Anyone else? Application. Okay, next week, we'll start in Joel 1, verse 8. Thank you for discussing tonight, letting me spring in. Um, if I don't know if the people online are figuring it out or not, but we'll get our worship pastor out of the hospital in Denver and get him back here, and I'll get another little lesson on making sure my volume is correct uh, for those online, and hopefully we'll have some volume that I can put this up on YouTube. So anyway, um, you guys have a great night. I'm gonna pray, and then we're gonna end, okay? Lord, thank you so much for using the Old Testament prophets and giving them messages, even though people thought they were wacky, Lord. Thank you for the encouragement it gives to us today and the reminder that we need to worry about what you think, not what people think. And we need to just hear from you and obey each day. We just need to take the next step of obedience of whatever that is that you have for us. And we pray that it's all differently you. You fine-tuned us all differently with different talents and different different uh, abilities and different words. So, Lord, just show us how we can obey you this week and tomorrow, how we're to share you, how as we dive into your word, we can share it with others, and, Lord, who we are to pray for, that they will have 
eyes to see and ears to hear. Praise in Jesus' name.